Hey team, we're going to learn how we can automate Chrome inside of a serverless function on Netlify with Puppeteer. I'm Colby Fayok, and if this is your first time here, make sure you hit subscribe for future updates. Netlify is a hosting and deployment platform that allows us to easily deploy our web apps. What it also does is allows us to build and deploy serverless functions, meaning we can really easily create API endpoints where we can hit that serverless function and perform the tasks we need. Now, usually in those functions, we have simple code where we have an input and we have an output and give that response. But sometimes we actually need to use the browser in order to automate things that we want to do. So to do that, we're going to use Puppeteer, where we're able to spin up a new instance of Chrome and we can ask it to perform whatever task we want, just like a human would inside of the browser. With this, we're going to do things like we can grab the page title of the web page, but we can also do other things like if we wanted to perform an API request where we search on this page and find out what the client side results are, we can grab those results and return it in the response. So to do this, we're going to start off from scratch where we're going to build our serverless function on Netlify, and then we're going to install Puppeteer and see how we can use that along with automating Chrome in order to perform our tasks. So in my terminal, I'm going to start off by running make dir my function then i'm going to navigate into that directory and then i'm going to run npm init and what that's going to do is it's going to create a new uh, node project for me where specifically it's going to create a package.json which allows me to start installing packages and actually getting productive so really we can just go ahead and enter through all these you can fill them out as you'd like but really we can just leave them as the default for now and we'll see that if we open up this project now we will have our package.json and really we can modify this anytime we want. So really, if you make all those choices and you hate them all, you can come back here really quickly and update anything that you want. Now, one thing to quickly note, since we are using this as a node project, if you're going to host this on GitHub, I highly recommend that you add a git ignore file because we want to add our node modules there so that we don't actually commit those out to our repository. One, because it's just a ton of space that we don't need to add there, but also it's best practice just to make sure anytime in somebody's installing a project, they're getting it fresh from the package.json or specifically the package lock or yarn lock. So next, before we actually dive into our function, in order to spin this up using Netlify, we're going to use the Netlify CLI, which is a nice tool that allows us to easily run our development mode, mode right on our local project and also deploy our project later. And we can have the same sort of functionality that we would expect from Netlify when we actually deploy. Now to do that, we can go ahead and install it using npm install Netlify CLI, and we want to pass in the G flag as we want to make sure that that's installed globally. Now you can also add it globally with Yarn if that's what you prefer. Now I already have this installed globally, but if I run that simply the same, it'll install the latest version, but you'll essentially be running that so you can reference that Netlify CLI anywhere. And once it's done, if you run the Netlify command, you'll see that you now get a list of all the commands available for Netlify. Now, we're not going to need it right this second, but one thing we also want to do is log into our Netlify account. What this will do is allow us to actually deploy our functions or whatever our web project is later. So I'm going to run Netlify login. And we can see that it's actually going to open up the browser for us to make it really easy to log in. We're here. I can just simply click authorize, head back over to my terminal and I'm now successfully logged in. Now at this point, we don't even really have much of a product going yet, but when we want to start out Netlify, we can run Netlify dev, which is going to try to spin up a new server for our project. And as we can see, we currently don't have anything found because we don't actually have anything on our project so far, but we can even see the logs to see that that is the case. Now we can get started now by setting up our new function. So to start, I'm going to create a new directory called functions and you can name this directory whatever you want. We can uh, set that in the configuration, but then inside I'm going to call my file meta.js as eventually we'll be getting metadata using this endpoint. But then I'm going to paste in this snippet, which we're going to set on the exports object a handler, which we're going to define an asynchronous function where we're going to receive two arguments. That is the event and the context of the event where we're then going to return a response. And this is essentially a serverless function. We're here, all we're doing right now is returning a status code of 200, saying that everything is okay. And then we're literally returning a status of okay. Now, the only other thing we need to do before we move on and actually see how this works is we need to create our Netlify configuration file. So in the root of the project, we're going to create a file called netlify.toml, where inside we wanna create a new section called build and then with a tab, we're going to specify that our functions, which this is going to be our functions directory, 
is equal to functions. And again, if you named your functions directory something else, make sure here is where you actually set it as a different name. But now if I actually start back up my development server by Netlify dev, we can see that when it loads back up in the browser, it still hasn't found anything, but that's because we're not serving a web project. But if we go to slash dot Netlify slash function slash meta, we can see our new endpoint. So while this doesn't seem like a lot, what we just did is created a new serverless function, which we can hit as an endpoint inside of our application or really anywhere. So now what we ultimately want to do is run Puppeteer in here. So let's get started installing those dependencies. To do this, we have two dependencies that we're going to need. First, we have Chrome AWS Lambda, then we have Puppeteer Core. Chrome AWS Lambda is going to provide us the binary of Chrome, as when we're actually trying to run Puppeteer on our serverless function, we don't have Chrome available. So what this does is it packages its, packages its uh, it up for us so that we can actually take advantage of Chrome and launch it headlessly inside of our serverless function. And as you can see, we need Puppeteer Core in order to drive this Chrome version. Now, the reason we're installing Puppeteer Core instead of the normal Puppeteer is because Puppeteer comes with all the browsers already stocked in it, which because we need to package that up ourselves with Chrome AWS Lambda, we're only going to install Core so that we can still drive that browser with Puppeteer. So in my project, I'm going to use Yarn, but feel free to follow along with NPM. So I'm going to run yarn add chrome aws lambda as well as puppeteer core where now once those packages are installed I could head back over to my code editor and at the top I'm going to first require those packages where I have my chromium and I have my puppeteer. So back inside of the Chrome AWS Lambda documentation for a second, we actually see how this is working, where we're going to use Puppeteer to launch an instance of a browser, where we're going to pass in some arguments in order to make that happen. So at the top of my file, I'm going to create a new constant called browser, and I'm gonna say I want to await Puppeteer with the launch method, where we're going to pass in our configuration object. First, we're going to define a property called args, which we're going to pass in as chromium.args, which is basically the Chrome flags that we receive from Chrome AWS Lambda. Where next, we're going to define a very similar property, but this one's going to be called executable path, where specifically for this one, we actually need to await so that this can execute and grab that path for us. Now, finally, we want this to be ran headless when we're actually running our serverless function. So finally, I'm going to pass in a headless value of true. Now, whenever we launch a browser, we want to also make sure we close the browser. So before with the return statement, I'm going to say await browser.close. Now at this point, we're not actually doing anything. We're just launching a browser, so we won't be able to see anything, but let's see what happens when we run Netlify dev. So in my terminal, I'm going to start back up my development server, but when the endpoint reloads, we actually see that we're getting an error and it's saying that it's failing to launch the browser process. Now, one issue with using Chrome AWS Lambda is it's not actually going to work as is out of the box locally. If you look inside of their documentation, this is a known issue, and they actually give a workaround where you can define Puppeteer as a dev dependency, and it should find it, but I actually didn't have any luck with that working myself. So instead, we can use environment variables so that we can manually set our execution or executable path when working locally. So to start, we're going to use an NPM package called .env, which is a very popular package for being able to manage environment variables. So I'm going to say yarn add .env. Next, inside of my actual function, before the await for the executable path, I'm going to say path or that value. So what this will do is it'll try to first find that environment variable, which we're only going to define locally, but if that doesn't exist, it's going to still try to find that executable path. But then finally, I'm going to copy that name and I'm going to create a new file called .env in the root of my project, where I'm going to set that as a new value. Now note, before we actually move on, since we are using a git ignore, we want to make sure we add that .env to that git ignore file, because we don't want to actually save or store our environment variables inside of git. Now this value is probably going to be different for most people, but I found there's a nice easy way to grab this. If we head to our browser and go to chrome colon slash slash version, we can see that we actually get a line called executable path, which we can simply copy that value and paste it into this environment variable. 
And now if you have your development server still running, at this point you wanna restart it so that it picks up that environment variable. So I'm gonna run Netlify dev. And now when the page reloads, we can see that we're getting that status okay again. So we're actually launching that browser with Puppeteer and it's returning an okay status. So now let's actually start using Puppeteer to actually grab some data. So to start, we wanna create a new page in order to access the page API inside of Puppeteer. So the first thing I'm going to do is make a new constant called page, and I'm going to use a wait so that I can run browser.newPage. And next, we wanna actually navigate to our page. So I'm gonna use a wait where I'm gonna say page.go to, and you can use any page you want in here, but I'm going to use spacejelly.dev for my example. And finally, because we have a really nice API in order to grab the title, I'm going to create a new constant called title, and I'm gonna set that equal to await page.title. So now in order to actually see this title, let's create a new object inside of our body. I'm gonna call that page, and then inside of it, I'm gonna simply pass in that title. If we head back over to our browser and refresh the page, we can see that Puppeteer actually went out using Chrome and grabbed that title of my page. Now the page title alone is handy, but what if we want other information like maybe the meta description? Now I'm gonna paste this one in, but here we're going to create new call, constant called description. And because we don't actually have nice handy methods for all of the different metadata on the page, we need to actually look and find that tag inside of our document using the eval selector, where we're then going to take that element and we're going to grab the content, which will be that description. And then finally, we'll take that description constant and pass it in just like we did the title. But just like before, if we now refresh the page, again, it's gonna use Chrome to go out and we see that we now have our description. So grabbing metadata can be really handy, but we wanna do something more interesting like interacting with a page. So what we're going to do is open up spacejelly.dev and we're going to go to the search field and we're gonna actually search for API and then grab these results. So to start, I'm going to actually duplicate my original file, call it results, where we're going to use a lot of the same boilerplate code, but we're just going to replace what we're actually doing with it. Now, the important thing for doing this is we wanna make sure we can find the selectors to actually navigate around the DOM. So to start, I wanna grab this ID of my search input, which is called search query. So when we first navigate to spacejelly.dev, the very first thing I'm going to do is run await page.focus, and I'm going to pass in that ID as my selector. So at this point inside of the browser, we should have that selected, that input. So next I wanna actually type something. So I'm gonna say await page.keyboard.type, and I'm gonna say API, just like we showed. Now finally, we wanna be able to scrape those results. So if we look inside of this, we have a div that's next to that search input where we can grab those that list of items and we can actually map through and grab all that data. Now I'm gonna actually paste this one in, but we can see that I'm creating this constant called results where I'm using the eval selector, which I'm using the double dollar sign so that it's querying all elements with this selector, where it's going to grab all of the links that are in that list of items. And then I'm gonna take all those links and I'm gonna grab both the text and the href so that I can create an array using the results constant. But then finally, I'm gonna take those results and instead of the page, I'm gonna pass that right through. And now if I actually go to my results endpoint, we can see that it's gonna load and we have all of our results. Now finally, we have our endpoints. We wanna actually deploy this out to the web. Luckily, because we're using Netlify CLI, this is really easy to do with Netlify. So the first thing I'm gonna do is simply run Netlify deploy. Now when doing this, it's going to ask a few questions such as, do you wanna actually link this to an existing site? Now I'm going to create a new site. So I'm gonna select that option. I wanna select the team that I wanna use, which in my case is Kobayashi Maru. And then it says I can select a site name. Now I'm not gonna bother with that. I'm just gonna let it create a random name. So I'm gonna set that as undefined. And we can see that it's actually going to start creating that, that website inside of Netlify. And then finally, it's going to ask us for the published directory. Now, since inside of this project, I'm doing everything from the root, it's going to remain as that dot, which means current directory. So when I hit it, it's going to go ahead and it's going to package up those endpoints and it's going to actually deploy it out to Netlify. We can even see that it created this website draft URL where if we open up in our browser, we see that we don't have anything right away because again, we don't have a web project. But if we actually visit that same address like we are locally and we can see that when it reloads, we actually get those same results like we did locally because it's grabbing it from spacejelly.dev. 
Now, if you also want to deploy that to production, all you have to do is simply add that prod flag to the end, and it's going to deploy it to your production as opposed to a preview like what we just did. But once it's done, we can open up again that prod URL. And like before, we can grab the URL of the actual endpoint or rather the path, go to it, and we can see our results. Now, this is where we're going to stop, but you can even extend this where you can use the context of the actual request where you can make sure that you're actually looking at something like a post request or a get request. So you can actually take these values in dynamically so that you're not actually hard coding in this URL or even the query every time you try to run this function. But whether you're just trying to find some search results, scraping the web, or if you want to actually run synthetic che checks for a test on your website, this is a great way to be able to automate that process. Using serverless functions with tools like Netlify gives us a lot of options for being able to provide functionality easily right inside of an API endpoint. Coupling that with tools like Puppeteer, we can do a lot of awesome things by leveraging the browser right inside of our functions. What's your favorite use case for serverless functions, or how about Puppeteer? Let me know in the comments. If you want to learn more about what you can do with serverless functions, make sure to check out my video where you can send emails with SendGrid right inside of the serverless functions. Or if you want to make sure you're actually testing the functions themselves, I'll show you how to use Jest to make sure that your functions are working just as expected. If you like this video, make sure you hit thumbs up and subscribe for future updates. Thanks for watching.